What? Harassing people for their political beliefs. My Roy Cohn. Uh, this is I'm Robert Evans. This <laughs> is Behind great. the Bastards. It's a podcast about terrible people. And I'm just going to cut right to the chase, as I already did. Today, we're talking about Roy motherfucking Cohn. Oh, my asshole. God. Joelle Monique is our guest. Joelle, Yo! producer at iHeartMedia. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm slightly unprofessional. I just bit into some peanut butter. I'm so sorry. I'm very Are you just hungry. doing yo? <laughs> very hungry. This has been my so favorite hungry. intro to an episode ever, you guys. Thank you. Joelle, what do you what do you know about Roy Cohn? Okay, so The Good Fight, which is one of my favorite TV shows of all time, had like a very like strong leaning Roy Cohn arc. I want to say season two. There's okay. a song was it called set Roy in the past. No, no, no. It's a, it, it basically was an opportunity uh, to educate people about how Trump could about, get away with some of the things uh, he was getting away with. Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yes, because so Roy Cohn that, is that guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in that, they made this song, which I think you'll really appreciate. It's called Roy Cohn Loves to Party. There's an animated yep. segment that goes along with it. It's peak excellence. And so I know, like, a two-minute real quick history yeah. of Roy Cohn. I know he's an awful human a monster um, yeah a real <laughs> yeah. terrible terrible guy yeah. so i'm excited to find out how terrible today what, what's funny about roy Cohn is that if you kind of measure him objectively against the standards of you know a lot of the people we talk about on this show he doesn't seem that bad like he's he's a bad person but he, he's not <laughs> like stalin or hitler but he wasn't murdering he's he was such an unpleasant well he may have he was oh. such an unpleasant human being that his name has become kind of like a byword for a, a monster like he's <laughs> he's up there just because of what a piece of shit he was to everyone around him and it's kind of amazing if you watch documentaries there's a great documentary um called Where's My Roy Cohn that interviews people who knew him and like at least two of like there, there are multiple people in that documentary who are friends of his who describe him as evil <laughs> like just because oh my god it's like oh yeah we I hung out with Roy but he was evil like he was he's absolutely was the the embodiment of human evil <laughs> wow how could you I wonder what was yeah. he bringing to that friendship that they were like we'll talk I just about skip over that. the evil part he was he was kind of a great friend um Oh, that yeah. kind of friend. No, it's all yeah. when you have like yeah. a super bitch of a friend, but she's good to you. And so she's she good keeps to all you the evil and a monster. away from you. Yeah. Yes. I like kind of get it. <laughs> yeah. It's the kind of friend where you're like, yeah, I know they are a monster. But also, if I ever need them, they will burn the world down for me. Um, my personal monster. Yeah, yeah, that's that's who Roy Cohn was. Um, <laughs> and it's one of the we'll talk about his relationship with Trump later. It's what Trump learned a lot from Roy Cohn. The thing he never learned from Roy Cohn was how to be loyal, because that is something Cohn was good at to his actual friends. He was very loyal and they weren't to him because it, it just turns out when you're friends with people who can be friends with a person who is pure, unadulterated human evil. They're not good at being loyal to you, even if you are to them. It's fun. It's a fun story. Uh, that documentary. <laughs> Where's my Roy Cohn? I do recommend watching. It gets its name from something Donald Trump said when uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions recused himself during the Mueller probe. President Donald Trump reportedly cried out, Where's my Roy Cohn? in a moment of panic <laughs> and fear. Um, yeah. So. We're going to talk all about that today. Roy Cohn was a lawyer. Uh, it's accurate to say that, but just saying like that's describing Roy Cohn as a lawyer uh, is such an incomplete explanation of who he was as to be totally inaccurate. Roy Cohn was a blackmail artist, a political fixer of the highest order, maybe the best there ever was, a man famous for being infamous and a man who weaponized sociopathy more effectively than any other political actor in U.S. history. He's a he's a hoot of a dude. <laughs> he he created the shortcuts to help us get where we got today. Thank yeah, you, Roy. yeah. He he's the man who built both Roger Stone and Donald Trump. Like he's what he a sucks. legacy. <laughs> like, yeah, what a, what a, he's a oh. remarkable piece of shit. Yeah, um, he's I, garbage. You, you love to see it. Yeah. <laughs> so. 
Roy Marcus Cohn was born on February 20th, 1927 in the Bronx, New York City. He was the only child of a wealthy Jewish couple, Dora and Albert. His father, Albert, was a judge and a major figure in the local Democratic Party. Uh, As a result, Roy grew up with politicians of all stripes dropping by his home for dinners and cocktail parties. So he's 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 born into the political upper crust, you know, from from I'm childhood. I'm seeing the snobby rich kid evolving. Like, oh yes, he he learned, he was one of those kids who spoke like an adult way too early. You were like, how yes. do you know these things? Yes, yes, absolutely. Like his parents let him drink at the cocktail parties. Absolutely, and they he did. Thought he was an adult <laughs> when he was really yeah. just an obnoxious trash <laughs> child. Yeah, he was definitely drinking at the adult table from a young age. There was no uh, kitty and he, table for him. No, no, no. <laughs> and obviously, like, he uh, he came from money. Uh, and not just, like, judge money, but his family has, like, wealth on all sides of it. His great uncle was the founder of the Lionel Corporation, uh, which oh, wow. makes, they make toy trains. Uh, and were, for a while, the largest toy manufacturer on the planet. Uh, Roy's maternal uncle, Bernard Marcus, was the president of the Bank of the United States. Um, oh, okay. So, again, ton of money in this family. Uh, and obviously, the fact that Bernard was the president of the Bank of the United States and Added to the family's gravitas and importance until October 29th uh, of 1929, when the stock market oh, crashed and the Great Depression got going. Because the Bank of the United States was one of the main things that caused, like, its collapse caused the Great Depression. Now, Roy was too young to remember much of what happened at the time, the stress and the panic. Uh, it would have been passed on to him, though, by the adults around him, especially because his uncle's bank was blamed for st- sparking the stock market crash. This wasn't entirely fair because a lot of people in a lot of banks were to blame for the Great Depression. But Bernard Marcus was the head of the bank that was most implicated, and he was also a Jew. So, um, he got blamed. He became like the scapegoat of the financial crash. America um, loves a scapegoat. We can't we can't hold yeah. everyone responsible, but we can't point yeah. to you and say you did it. <laughs> yeah, so Bernard Marcus is Jewish. The Bank of the U.S. is heavily frequented by Jewish immigrants, and everybody's angry at Jewish people when the economy collapses because racism. Uh, so, Woo-hoo! yeah, uh, Bernard Marcus actually becomes the only banker to go to prison for the financial crisis for the Great Depression. Are like they pick kidding? one and it's the Jewish guy. <laughs> Lord Jesus, that's awful. Which is not to say that he didn't do anything, because he he definitely did. But sure. it was he did not. He should certainly shouldn't have been the only banker to go to prison. <laughs> he didn't row that boat alone. He didn't single handedly mm-hmm. tank our economy. Come on now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, so he. This is like a huge f- fact of shame for the Cohn family. Uh, and to sure. this day, Cohn survive. Roy Cohn's surviving relatives consider the case to have been a matter of scapegoating. Um, because again, he was the only banker to go to jail. Um, and this really left an impact on Roy because he visited his uncle in prison when he was a small child. Some of Roy's earliest memories were seeing his uncle Bernard in Sing Sing. One of his cousins mm-hmm. later wrote, quote, that left Cone determined to beat the establishment. So from oh. an early age, you got to think about it this way. He grows up thinking like, yeah, we're Jewish, but like we're part of the ruling class, the wealthy class. Mm-hmm. And we're all, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Christian or whatever, as long as you're in that upper crust. And then when a crisis hits, it turns out that we're not all part of the same thing because all mm-hmm. of the other mm-hmm. rich people blame the Jew, right? Like that's the way Whoa. it goes. Yeah. I didn't expect um, to have any sort of empathy in this episode at all, but as somebody who understands the realization of racism like oh me yeah uh a a fragment of empathy for baby roy cohen before he becomes the evil we know him to be today yeah this has an impact on the evil because he realizes like oh money won't protect me even like from like the fact that i'm different actually does matter we're not all the same even though we're rich and so i just like i am now i like i'm not a part of the establishment so i must be at war with it that's that's the idea that roy cone baby roy cone grows up with (laughs) yeah he sure did conclusion lord yeah Uh, It's super fun. So a family friend who was around at the time claimed, quote, the family had been absolutely shamed when Bernard Marcus went to prison. Roy kept a scrapbook as a little boy of all the pictures of his uncle, Bernie Marcus. He would show them to his babysitters. Once his mother saw him doing this and she yelled and took the scrapbook away because he loved his uncle. He was proud of his uncle. He had like a scrapbook of his uncle um, who was like a big figure in his life. And his mom wanted to like pretend he didn't exist. 
after this. I wish there was a child psychologist here to like break down the so like a child weird. purposely yeah. uncovering what the family has tried to hide and shame to be like, no, this guy is good. And yeah. they're just like, no, hide that. And what does that do to your psych psyche that says, if you make a mistake, also we will just f- remove you from our yeah. memory. The yeah. scrapbook thing is like, I like my I don't have a scrapbook of one of my relatives. It's just so weird. Yeah, it's it's I mean, I you know, it's it's sweet. He clearly cared about his uncle um, and his mom is telling him, no, no, no. He made a mistake. So we don't celebrate his existence anymore, right. which, yeah, you, you're right, Joel. That has to that transmits a message to a growing little boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's not a good one. <laughs> don't fuck up. OK, mm-hmm. you can be disappeared. Is his mother yeah, you actually can be Queen Elizabeth? <laughs> That's my question. <laughs> I mean, emotionally, yes. So, fair, fair enough. Despite the family shame, Roy's father remained a judge and a connected person in Democratic Party politics. When Roy was 10, his father introduced him to his first president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So again, age 10 is when this kid starts hobnobbing with the president, not just the president, a president of the United States, but like the president of the United States, because no president's ever had more power than fucking FDR. Fair enough. Um, So yeah, that's who Roy's hanging out with at age 10. Uh, He started giving speeches at political rallies the year before when he was nine, and he was so comfortable talking shop that as soon as he met FDR, he told the president he agreed with his plan to pack the Supreme Court. So that's like this 10-year-old boy meets FDR, and the first thing he's like is like, yeah, you got to increase the the number of people in the Supreme Court so that you can rule unchallenged, you know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's that's where his head is so the cone the cone family as you might have guessed was not what we would call healthy in fact roy's parents marriage is generally described as loveless i found oh. a yeah yeah well what did you I did mean, you expect there was a lot of love in that relationship <laughs> i'm always shocked when i hear about loveless marriages i'm like how did you survive but also i, I understand um the era you know mm-hmm. the marriages of convenience and or This is a financial person in my bracket who won't steal from me, so... Yeah, this is a political marriage, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, I found a fun article in The Wrap by David Marcus, who is the son of Roy's first cousin. Uh, And by the way, his dad, David's dad, refused to talk to Roy Cohn for decades. Now, David (laughs) grew up to be a journalist, and obviously, like, as a journalist with Roy Cohn as an uncle, you're going to interview him and he did interview Roy several times uh in 2019 he wrote an article titled five things you may not know about my vile malicious cousin Roy Cohn which is quite a listicle can we we talk about the 360 of like Roy trying to show photos of his like Mm -hmm. imprisoned uncle to then his nephew sharing with the world via a paper, the yeah. horribleness of his uncle. There's something very balanced about it's a this, fun like, yeah. uncle nephew relationship. <laughs> it's a fun family. <laughs> uh, so yeah, he wrote he re- he writes this about Roy Cohn's mother. Quote. My relatives couldn't stand Roy's overbearing mother, Dora Marcus Cohn. She was the original helicopter parent, long before anybody knew that term, fussing over her only son's grades, appearance, and relationships. When Roy went to sleepaway camp, Dora rented a room down the road. He lived with his mother until she died when he was 40. So, (laughs) some Norman Bates vibes coming off this boy. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, man. Listen, kids, we're not talking about you. We understand financial straits and everything. But if you could afford to not live with your yeah. mother. If you and- are a wealthy lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in an era where that people used to clown on people so hard for still living with their mm-hmm. parents. You know, that's yeah. uh, that's what we call an unhealthy relationship. Yeah. He's not like a living with his mom. One, perhaps. Because like he's got to take care of her or because like he's living with his mom because he, he can't imagine what to do without her for until he's 40 um Yikes. yeah you get the feeling it wasn't there was some yeah there was there was absolutely some weird shit going on there so by the 1940s the family fortunes had recovered and the cones were again at the center of a deeply influential network of new york socialites and politicos as soon as roy was a teenager his parents pushed him to attend their parties according to one of those guests roy took naturally to politics socializing and schmoozing like an old veteran one attendee later recalled It was extraordinary to see 10 grown-up couples and then sit next to a 15-year-old. Roy was always on the scene. He fit right in. One of his friends later told an interviewer, when he was 16, he was 40. 
Yeah, those kids yeah. are not okay. This is the kind of excuse we hear about like <laughs> When we see very, very young girls with older men, they're like, oh, well, they seem so mature. Mm-hmm. That person needs help. Yeah. Help them. Get but them she's out of 17. The yeah. <laughs> right. It's not okay. Yeah. Uh, your genius does not make you mature, nor does it give you the years of experience yeah. that you need to navigate situations with actual adults. Well, and in, it's a bit different in Roy's case because, like, he's not in a relationship with these people, but they're the ones he's socializing with, and they lead him to. I, you, I don't think Roy ever had a childhood. And I'm not That's sure what I'm he saying, ever. Yeah, though. exactly. Yeah. That's the sad. Like it was stolen from him because he never had the opportunity to be treated like a child. Yeah. You know, and then then you don't know the joys of childhood, which makes you a very weird, bitter old adult. Yeah, which he absolutely is a weird, bitter old adult. So as a rich kid, Roy's peers were from similarly august backgrounds. His buddy Generoso Pope Jr. grew up to be the owner of the National Enquirer. You wonder why that magazine is so <laughs> close to. Donald Trump. His friend Cy Newhouse oh, wow. Jr. became the wait, publisher wait, wait, of the wait, National wait, Enquirer. Wait, wait, wait. What? <laughs> that was really quick to go over. Yeah. Just like yeah. L- let that sink in. Yeah, his second. Roy's best buddy grew up to be owned the National Enquirer. His other best friend became the publisher. And then Roy became Donald Trump's good friend. And Donald Trump has had a lifelong positive relationship with the National Enquirer. Yes, I just What's wanted so to say that? it one more time. Yeah. What? Just so yeah. much in one little wow. sentence. Roy Cohn's friend Richard Berlin became the chairman of Condé Nast, and his friend Bill Fugazi grew up to be the owner of a massive travel and limousine company. So wow. these are Roy Cohn's childhood buddies. Like, the act, the only kids he spends his time around grow up to be those people. And they're inheriting a lot of what they get, right? Like, they're not yeah. founding that shit, you know? Mm-mm. And if they are, they're inheriting a bunch of money to found that shit. So from an early age, Cohn showed a strong inclination towards what would become his life's work. He ran what his biographer calls the Roy Cohn Barter and Swap Exchange while he was in junior high school. This was an influence and information peddling racket. Roy wrote a gossip column for his local newspaper, and he would trade stories and manipulate the stories he published in exchange for favors from popular kids. What? <laughs> yeah. What? What? Yeah. How? Okay, I just so many things have just happened in my head. First, yeah, of all, there's I a lot know, going on there. I had no idea Roy Cohen was actually Dan Humphrey from Gossip Girl, which actually <laughs> Kinda, makes yeah. so much sense. Uh, and then the idea of like a 12 or 13 year old, like again having the foresight and knowledge to understand how an operation like that could work, seems just like the most batshit thing i've ever heard like i'll lie for you yeah spread that lie and you know you you kick, kick me back some favors do we know what kind of favors he was getting in exchange they were like he got jobs and stuff as a kid over this stuff wow. and you have to assume he got like invites to parties and whatnot like it it was uh you know it, it was not the kind of favors he would be getting later but he's experiment because later his favors would be stuff like getting people in or out of prison um right. but he's 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 starting to learn how if you have control Control of a media organ, you can get things from people by either planting stories about them or refusing to plant stories about them. Um, like that's he's trading gossip for favors. Um, and he's learning how to do that again as a teenager. And he's learning to do that within the context of a high school, but he's also spending all of his time talking to adult politicians. And you can he's putting this stuff together. Like he knows right, what right. he's going to be. Roy Cohn knew what he wanted to be from a very young age. And it was always a shady political fixer. He's you look at what Rudy Giuliani is doing these days, and he's bad at it. Rudy Giuliani is oh, terrible. 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 You can't even file a lawsuit correctly, sir. Please yeah. walk out the door. Roy Roy Cohn is the good version of that. And not good in a moral sense, but good in Roy was good at this. Um, he knew how to do it. He knew how to do it. And you can see the reason Donald Trump keeps having Giuliani do all this shit is because he's desperately wants to have a Roy Cohn. But he doesn't. Because exactly. there was I only one. Trump, but I really feel like yeah. there's got to be somebody more capable. <laughs> Giuliani. You know, not not who's also capable of the same kind of loyalty. That's the thing. Mm. Giuliani's loyal to the president, at least so far, but incompetent. Roy was loyal and competent, and that that's what Trump wants. 
But sadly, we'll talk about why Roy, Co- Roy Cohn ain't around no more. So <laughs> Roy went to the kind of elementary and high schools that rich kids get to attend, the ones that cost mm. as much as a small house for a year of tuition. He went to Columbia Law School and he graduated at age 20 with both a bachelor's degree and a law degree. So like God very, damn, very smart kid. Um, yeah. So age 20, he's out of college. He's a he's a he's a he's a an, an admitted to the bar lawyer and he is ready to make his mark on the world using his father's connection. He gets a job at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District, and he got the gig the same day that he was formally admitted to the bar, in case you're wondering what kind of impact his judge dad had on all that. The day he becomes a lawyer, he's working for the U.S. Attorney's Office. Like That's very convenient. Yeah, it helps. Now, for reasons that are not exactly clear to me, Roy became fascinated with what was seen as the looming threat of Soviet influence on the United States. His interest drew him in 1951 to the job of prosecuting Julius and Ethel Rosenberg for espionage. Now, do you know much about the Julius and Ethel Rosenberg case? I feel pretty educated on it. Yes. But it, I would definitely need to hear more. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the Rosenbergs were committed communists, and Julius was an electrical engineer with connections to all manner of sciencey folks. He spent years in the Army Signal Signal Corps, and he fed the USSR information about a bunch of different U.S. weapons technologies. At one point, even smuggling his handler a complete proximity fuse. So Julius is absolutely a spy for the Soviet Union, um, and and giving them a lot of stuff. Uh, he was eventually fired from the Army when it was revealed that he had been a member of the Communist Party in the 30s, but he remained good at meeting sciencey folks who were involved in the defense department. And one of the folks that he met after getting fired from the army was working on the Manhattan Project. Now, there's a lot of debate over exactly how helpful the nuclear secrets that he stole were. And I think the the consensus is that the, the USSR would have developed a bomb in more or less the same time frame without Julius Rosenberg. But he did give them information on the A-bomb. And the Pentagon was, you know, this, the Soviet Union in the late 40s comes out with an A-bomb of their own. And the Pentagon is really surprised because they had thought it would take the Soviet it's a lot longer to make an A-bomb. And they assume that the only way they could have possibly built it is if a spy had given them all of the information. And again, uh-huh. the Soviets had really good scientists, in part because they stole scientists from the Nazis too, in part because they just had good scientists. Like, they didn't need... It, it's probable that they would not have needed what Julius provided them with to have built the A-bomb, but he had he had provided them with some secrets. And when he was eventually found out, the defense in, uh, establishment uses him as a scapegoat for the entire fact that a nuclear arms race started, right? They need someone to blame for the fact that the Soviets have a bomb, and they blame Julius Rosenberg. They also blame his wife, Ethel Rosenberg. Now, Ethel had been an actress, and there remains debate as to the exact extent of her involvement. She was charged with being a full party to her husband's espionage. So she is charged with being uh, just as much of a spy as her husband. Um, now, a lot of information has come out since the fall of the Soviet Union, um, and it suggests that while she was aware of and approved of her husband's activities, she was probably not playing an active role in spreading atomic secrets. And there was evidence at the time that she was not playing an active role in spreading atomic secrets. Um, They didn't have any evidence that she was. But Roy Cohn wanted both Rosenbergs convicted and executed. He didn't just want Julius executed. He wanted Ethel executed as well. Um, And... Yeah, I'm going to quote from a a write-up in the magazine Forward. Quote... The case that made him the espionage trial of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg was a prime example of Cohn's law skirting tactics and the demons that propelled his career. Cohn saw the case as an opportunity to make his name as a ruthless prosecutor and recoup the status his family had lost. He had a score to settle, said one person. When Cohn was vicious in pushing for Ethel and Julius Rosenberg's execution, illegally communicating with Judge Irving Kaufman, who ironically called Cohn from a phone booth outside the Park Avenue synagogue, he may have been trying to lift the stigma of family shame. He was responding, his relatives suggest, not just to anti-communist animus, but to its inevitable link to Jews like him. He was the definition of a self-hating Jew, Cohn's cousin David Marcus says in the film. He wanted to show the world that he wasn't Jewish. So... Cohn's family are Jewish people scapegoated for the Great Depression. And then when Jewish people, when he has a chance to scapegoat another Jewish couple as responsible for the Russians getting the bomb, he does that in part to kind of wipe the shame away from his family and prove we're loyal Americans. Like, 
the wow. this Jewish family like is are traitors, but like the people prosecuting him and the judge, we're loyal Jews. Like that's kind of the thing that's co- going on in Cohn's head. Some real house slave shit. Like, yeah, that's just to be honest about it. Like this yeah. idea that you could cleanse your family by destroying another yeah. is. Uh, I mean, it explains a lot about him and his ideology. Yeah, as it's, a whole, it's pretty dark. Um, now, Roy's defining moment in the trial came during his cross-examination of David Greengrass, Ethel Rosenberg's brother. The prosecution had initially relied upon getting Ethel to testify against her husband in exchange for clemency, but she refused to talk. This pissed off Roy, but it also left the state in a bind because there was no hard evidence that Ethel Rosenberg had done anything. So Cohn went to David, who had helped with the espionage, and promised him that if he lied about his sister's role in the conspiracy, David and his wife would get lesser sentences. Greengrass later admitted to lying on the stand at Cohn's direction, but it didn't matter. Ethel was convicted. So Cohn goes to this guy, says, like, I'll make sure you and your wife don't get ex, you get lesser sentences if you say that Ethel was a part of the espionage. And David gets up in court and he lies about Ethel Rosenberg's complicity in the espionage. And so she gets convicted um, along with Julius, who, you know, for whatever you want to say about how fair or unfair the penalty was, Julius was guilty of espionage. He did Um, the crime. He did the crime. It's wild to me that, like, it seems, especially in this era, like, not a lot, not a lot of women prisons, not a lot of females nope. behind bars, certainly not a lot being executed. It's kind of intense that, like, how much his own self hate was, yeah. As far as like, if if that is in truth what stemmed a lot of these decision making, like the idea of like, no, we got to fry them all, is like just intense and horrifying. Yeah. Now, um. Here's the thing that's fun about America in this period of time is no American at this point in time, when Julius and Ethel Rosenberg are being tried, no American had ever been executed for treason or espionage outside of war, outside of a war. So that hasn't happened. So people are talking about like most people who are like, well, yeah, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg are probably guilty. They need to be punished. Don't want them. A lot of people don't want them to be executed because we don't do that as a country at this point. Right. right that's the idea. Right. That's not what we are. We don't kill people outside I mean, of a war coming, for engaging in this. And we're coming hot off the Geneva Convention. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's so all we pretty just recent. Established all these laws and. Stuff about how to conduct yourself. Wow, okay. But Roy Cohn wants them dead. And as it turned out, now normally the prosecutor's not supposed to have any say in in the punishment. That's, you know, the judges in this sort of a case. That's the judges' uh, purview. But Cohn would wind up having a strong say in her punishment. He later claimed, number one, that he had pulled strings to make sure that Kaufman was the judge who got the case. There's no (laughs) evidence that this was true, except for the fact that Kaufman called Roy Cohn repeatedly when he had questions about the case, which kind of suggests that Kaufman was indebted to Roy Cohn. And again, he's in his 20s at this point. (laughs) So the judge was calling Roy and being like, you know, I have some questions about this case. Yeah. Ah! Most, most particularly, the judge is calling Roy Cohn and saying, hey, should I execute? Should I have these people executed? Is that fair? Like that, that's the kind of shit that like he's, he's, he's coming up to them with. Um, Wow. Yeah. So, which is pretty dark. Um, yeah. And, and of course, Roy Cohn is like, yeah, absolutely. You should be, you should kill these people. Um, you win my case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? So, yeah, the, uh, again, like, yeah. Uh, so the judge calls Roy on the phone and is like, I don't know. I feel like weird about executing these people. We've never done that before in this kind of context. What do you think I should do? And like, should I, should I execute uh, Ethel as well. And Roy is like, yes, you should execute them both. And he tells the judge, the way I see it, she being Ethel is worse than Julius. So he's he's whole hog like, yes, you need to have these people hung um, or ex- like electrocuted. They were electrocuted. But yeah. I wonder if the silence, now listen, I'm not a psychologist, listeners, but I'm, yeah. I'm going to play one for a second here. I wonder if like part of the reason he was like, she's worse is because she was willing to not say anything and this idea of like possibly this couple representing his parents and the idea of their like hiding and then being part of the downfall of America during the Great Depression. I wonder if there are are links in his brain to those things. Yeah, you think you get the feeling. Yeah, probably. 
Probably. Yeah. What a fucked up guy. Robert. Yeah, do, he's Do you know what time it is? Oh, is it time for products and services? Perhaps. You know who <laughs> won't order the executions of a probably innocent woman and her husband during peacetime for espionage? I really hope it's our uh, our sponsors <laughs> and the products yeah, and services. Yeah, that is provide. that's the only standard we have for our our our, our products <laughs> is the Julius and Ethel Rosenberg case. We ask all of them about it, uh, and all of them say that happened decades before you were born. Why are you asking us about this? None of these companies <laughs> existed at that point in time, and we demand a response. And that's why we have so very few advertisers. They think it's weird. <laughs> a lot of people think it's weird. Anyways. Here's ads. We're back. Uh, so, Judge Kaufman, having consulted with Roy Cohn, uh, sentences both Rosenbergs to die, telling them in court, I consider your crime worse than murder. I believe your conduct in putting into the hands of the Russians the A-bomb years before our best scientists predicted Russia would perfect the bomb has already caused, in my opinion, the communist aggression in Korea, with the resultant casualties exceeding 50,000 and who knows, but millions more of innocent people may pay the price for your treason. Indeed, by your betrayal, you undoubtedly have altered the course of history to the disadvantage of our country. No one can say that we do not live in a constant state of tension. We have evidence of your treachery all around us every day for the civilian defense activities throughout the nation are aimed at preparing us for an atom bomb attack. So he's not wrong that Russia getting the bomb made everybody scared, but also not really right in saying that the fact that Russia, number one, that the Rosenbergs were responsible for Russia getting the bomb earlier, but also like, you know, the fact that the United States was had been so willing to use the bomb on Russia before they got a bomb of their own might be responsible for some of the paranoia and fear. Like the fact that, you know, Truman dropped the bomb on Japan largely to scare Russia and the fact that MacArthur attempted to use the bomb on Korea and had to be forced, you know, there's there's a lot going on there. Anyway, internationally, the cause of the Rosenbergs became one of the first major anti-American movements of the post-war era. And remember, Fucking post-World War II, basically everybody likes the United States. Like, very yeah. popular country worldwide because, you know, the Nazis, and we're not the Nazis, yeah. and a lot of refugees had come here. And, like, not to say that the horrible things the U.S. had done, you know, genocides of the Native Americans and slavery and stuff hadn't happened, but, like, internationally, pretty popular country in 1946. <laughs> yeah. Those were our golden days, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Industry that, booming. Yeah. People happy. Yeah, people are pretty happy with us. The, the fact that we condemn the Rosenbergs to execution pisses off a lot of people. And again, starts like one of the first international anti-American movements. A lot of people thought they were innocent, and those who didn't feel they were innocent at least felt that the punishment didn't fit the crime. Marxist John Paul Sartre described the whole conviction as a legal lynching which smears mm. with blood a whole nation. By killing the Rosenbergs, you have quite simply tried to halt the progress of science by human sacrifice. Magic, witch hunts, autos de fe, sacrifices. We are here getting to the point. Your country is sick with fear. You are afraid of the shadow of your own bomb. Mm. Which is very I, much what's happening. We invite, we yeah. invent a doomsday device and assume we'll be the only ones to ever have it. And then when we have to fear it, we're like, oh God. This is what we were doing to the rest of the world, but we Our, don't. Everybody else is mm -hmm. evil. We've never done anything yeah. like, yeah, and and it continues today. So yeah. much fun. Yeah, our country's really so, stupid. It's really yeah, yeah. So the United States and President Eisenhower did not listen to international outrage. The Rosen and there's huge protests in the United States too, by the way. Sure. Thousands and thousands of people taking to the streets. Um, nobody in the government listened. The Rosenbergs were executed on June 19th, 1953. Julius's execution went smoothly enough, but the first several shocks failed to kill Ethel. The executioner Aww. was forced to repeat the process so many times he nearly lit her on fire. Smoke Jesus was pouring Christ. out from her head. It was and remains a profoundly gross story, and a lot of people at the time knew it was disgusting. Many of Roy Cohn's family were horrified about his actions. He later told a reporter with pride, I very early in my life broke with tradition and left my Jewish upper class oriented life in New York and became a contradiction of everything I was supposed to stand for. Yikes. Yeah. So he knows um, what he's doing. Yeah, it's really great to shit on your entire family and yeah. everything they stood for. Cool. Yeah. 
So there were, of course, people who deeply appreciated Cohn's tactics and motivations. One of them was J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI. <laughs> the two struck up a fast friendship and would actually exchange Christmas gifts for more than 20 years, if you're looking at the kind of guy who Roy <laughs> genuinely appreciates, and vice versa. One reporter described the two as ideological soulmates. Cone wow. became the F- yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't wow. want to be you don't want to be J. Edgar Hoover's soulmate. <laughs> no, you do not. Uh, real bad person. So Cone became the FBI's unofficial liaison to the press. And I'm going to quote here from the L.A. Times. Anything Hoover wanted to plant about someone, friend or foe, he directed to Cohn. So reliable was this gossip network that Walter Winchell's secretary, and Walter Winchell is a, a very influential gossip columnist at the time, dutifully awaited Cohn's reputation-destroying phone calls. When they wanted to stick it to somebody, former Rep. Neil Gallagher told Von Hoffman, who's Roy's biographer, that was Roy's job. Oh, man. To be wealthy and be able to destroy somebody with yeah. a phone call yeah. is power I don't think I will ever possess. No, that uh, is Roy Cohn. Absolutely. That is just, it's it's too much power. Yeah. It's too, way too much power to just be like, I don't like you. Mm -hmm. LA Times, print me something up bad about this guy. <laughs> Who cares about facts? Yeah. And we what are. what's journalism? fun about this episode is, you know that Billy Joel, We Didn't Start the Fire song? Mm. There's like five different people who are named in that song that are in this episode, including Roy Cohn. He's right before one pour on. Like, yeah. Also, Walter Winchell and Joe McCarthy, who we're about to talk about, is in the song. So, yeah, this is really we're really burning through that song here. <laughs> Love it. So it was Hoover who introduced young Roy Cohn to a man who would come to define the early part of his career, Senator Joseph McCarthy. <laughs> another gem of a person. <laughs> another, another real hero. In short order, Roy became the senator's right-hand man as the Red Scare kicked up into high gear. And this is where we need to peel away from Roy Cohn for just a moment to talk about the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC. It was established in 1938 by a Congress fuck named Martin Dees, and at first it wasn't entirely a bad thing. There were a ton of Nazi organizers and spies in the United States doing their best to cockslap American democracy, and the Dees Committee, which turned into HUAC, helped to identify and punish some of these guys. So, not entirely a bad thing if there's Nazis in your country. Probably out of... Deal with that. Probably they should a, leave right into the fuck yeah, now. Yeah, you should probably have a committee who's responsible for being like, we got to get these Nazis out of here, huh? It, it Unfortunately, does make me happy when you read a paragraph that I can tell you were you felt good about when you wrote it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, as is always the case with the U.S. government, the committee's attention soon turned away from the dangerous right-wing activists to left-wing activists. HUAC was at the forefront of an unhinged and fundamentally irrational investigation into Hollywood communists. So they go from like, <laughs> actual Nazis trying to destroy the the country, trying to destroy democracy, to, and there's some commies in Hollywood who think people ought to have health care and shit. Yeah, it's very funny. Um, and the, the list of people in Hollywood that HUAC investigates is just fundamentally absurd. Humphrey Bogart made the list, as did Clark Gable and 10-year-old Shirley Temple. That bitch. 10-year-old Shirley Temple. She's <laughs> dancing with the blacks, okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's fundamentally But she's a America. Tommy Badge, didn't you know? <laughs> yeah, because she's dancing with black people. Yeah, can't have that shit. She's hiding uh, she all her secrets in each one of her individual curls. <laughs> and, I'm, I'm trying to imagine like J.M. Yeah. Hoover listening to Shirley Temple's phone calls at 10. Yeah. Is she talking to her grandmother? <laughs> she's like, animal it, crackers. And my he's like, what's that code for? What is that code for? <laughs> <laughs> she's got to break them out of the zoos. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's very funny because when I was a kid, like Shirley Temple was like the symbol of American innocence in the 1950s. Yeah. And the reality is that at age 10, she was interrogated by the FBI as to the nature of her connections to the <laughs> Communist Party. Sucks. Jesus Lord. Oh, my. I mean, it's so don't you good. Feel like, you'd have to be like, this is unhinged. If you're part of, if you're like well, the 40s, probably one guess, of like yeah. three sane people. In Are you that kidding room, me? And you're like, what is yeah. going on? It, yeah, there was there was briefly a tiny amount of rationality crept into things in the like during World War II, and I'm going to quote from a write up in the Minnesota playlist about that. World War II put a stop to these activities, but in 1947, the committee renewed their investigations. Joseph McCarthy, a junior senator from Wisconsin, wanted to make a name for himself. And along with attorney Roy Cohn and senator, later president, Richard Nixon, the committee assured blacklisted individuals wouldn't work for years to come. 
Among those first listed, Humphrey Bogart, James Cagney, Catherine Hepburn, Gail Sondergaard, Melvin Douglas, and Frederick Marsh. Screenwriter Dalton Trumbo was branded a communist, but continued writing under different aliases and won Oscars. In 1956, when Robert Rich's name was called for The Brave One, no one accepted the award, causing suspicions to rise. Trumbo, under the name Sam Jackson, wrote the screenplay for Spartacus, which parallels the Huac hearings. Arthur Miller's play, The Crucibles, is an allegory of these witch hunts. So... If you ever had to read The Crucible, you know, sure or the, the play, at least by Miller, you can blame Roy Cohn and Joe McCarthy. Um, <laughs> now, one particularly cowardly actor, Adolf Minju, cooperated with the committee, Huac and named names. The this named people. Bastard. Yeah, yeah. And the named people were interrogated publicly. Their careers were shattered. Ten brave actors and screenwriters protested this and refused to name names. They included Iva Bessie, Herman Biberman, Lester Cole, Edward Dimitrick, Ring Larder Jr., John Howard Larson, Albert Maltz, Samuel Ornitz, Adrian Scott, and Dalton Trumbo. Huac punished these brave people by subpoenaing the shit out of all of them 